Which Formula One tracks are the best? Which ones are the worst? Questions that have been debated ad nauseum for decades and have no definitive answer. But I've decided to try and help get to some form of consensus by making a tier list that includes every Formula One track. Not just from this season, not just from this era, no, every single one. To the best of my knowledge, every layout of every circuit that has ever hosted a world championship race is here. That's 77 tracks with 188 individual layouts covering 74 seasons of Grand Prix racing. I don't think I've missed anything because I'm such a goddamn nerd, but if I have, please let me know and I will update the tier list if anything that meets the criteria is brought to my attention. But what is the criteria? So when I set out to do this, I laid down a couple of ground rules. The first is that the track had to have hosted at least one race that counted for points in the World Drivers' Championship as organized by the FIA since 1950. I use Formula One as a bit of a blanket catch-all term because since 1981, Formula One has been synonymous with the World Drivers' Championship, but there are a few caveats and technicalities. Let me explain. Up until the mid-1980s, many races were run for Formula One cars that didn't count for points in the World Championship. So if a track has technically hosted a Formula One race but hasn't hosted a World Championship race, then it's out. Meanwhile, in 1952 and 1953, the FIA ran the championship to Formula Two regulations because no one except Ferrari had a competitive, up-to-date Formula One car. Regardless, those seasons were still run as the World Drivers' Championship, so any tracks from 1952 and 1953 are in. Thirdly, and probably most controversially, the Indianapolis 500 counted towards the World Championship between 1950 and 1960. And on that technicality, the Indianapolis Oval is included in this tier list. Though, it's worth noting that the Indy 500 was basically its own race the whole time. The only other rule is that track layout changes take priority over everything else. So if as little as a single corner is significantly reprofiled, I count that as a new layout, but I'm not counting things like track widening, leveling of hills, or upgrades to pit lane facilities and runoff areas. Not only would it overcomplicate something that's already complicated enough, I just couldn't be bothered. Look, look, look at the bags under my eyes. I have spent enough time on this. Too many hours researching, looking at historic footage and photographs, making the maps and putting them all into labelled image files to make this bloody thing. You can help make this worth my time by liking and sharing this video and subscribing if you wish, as well as making use of the tier list yourself. Yes, that's right, this tier list is publicly available. So if you disagree with my ranking, I can say I don't care, make your own. The link is down in the description. It's gonna be a big undertaking, but let's be real, it's the off season. You probably have the time. And I have just enough time to tell you about a really good deal. What's this on my hand? It's from Sudspeed, a new Australian company that makes sim racing gloves. I received a pair of these from Sudspeed a couple of months ago and I'm very happy with them. I've been using them in my streams when I've been sim racing. They really are fantastic. Great build quality, they're well put together, they're breathable and comfortable, they fit me really well. And they've also got little, little pads on the forefinger and thumb, so you can use touch screens with them, which is really handy. And what's more, Sudspeed have partnered with me to help you save. If you want a pair of sim racing gloves just like these, all you need to do is go to sudspeed.com and use my code SOUTHPAWRACER at checkout. Usually you would get 10% off, but Sudspeed is still having their Black Friday sale up until the 30th of November, so the discount has been upped to 35%. Now that's, that's, that's a pretty good deal. They offer worldwide shipping at competitive rates, and if you're in Australia or New Zealand, shipping is free. 
Once again, buy a pair of sim racing gloves or a t-shirt at sudspeed.com and use my code SOUTHPAWRACER at checkout to receive a 35% discount until the 30th of November. After that, you'll still get 10% off. You'll be supporting an Australian company and you'll be supporting me and the channel as well. Thank you, Sudspeed. With all of that said, let's move on to my own ranking, which starts now. Let's do this. Currently in my temporary uh, desk work space, I'm working on rebuilding my studio. Um, it's almost done and I should be able to move back into air conditioned comfort pretty soon. Also say hi to Felix. He's uh, looking a little not alive at the moment, but I can assure you he is. He's gonna be keeping his company while we get this done. Aren't you, Bob? Yeah? All right, you, you, you just relax while I do the hard work. So this is the tier list right here. It has your usual roster of rows. You got S, A, B, C, D, and F tiers, and a little bit of an extra explanation of what the rankings mean. Of course, where exactly tracks go and how liberal you wanna be with the definition of rankings is up to your interpretation. Let's begin. Uh, I guess we'll start from the top. That's always the best place to do it. Adelaide. My bias is gonna be showing right away. Adelaide is, I think, one of the greatest uh, street circuits, greatest Australian race tracks, greatest F1 circuits of all time. If I'm going to be logical about it though, it's it's not quite an S tier circuit. I'd, I'd like to reserve S for, you know, the true spectacular historic greats, you know, like uh, tracks will probably see later on. I shall put Adelaide in A. It is, uh, I absolutely love this track. I've got a whole video on it. Um, you can check that out later if you want. We'll just go in alphabetical order, I suppose. Ain Diab. Now, this circuit uh, is one of the tracks that I don't know much about. It hosted the Moroccan Grand Prix once in 1958. And um, from what I've seen of it, it's a very fast circuit using public roads around the city of Ain Diab in Morocco. Um, and it looks pretty entertaining, but uh, to me, I feel like it doesn't really jump out at me as, as, a, as a track to really be remembered. But you're opinion might be different. For me, I think I'm going to put Ain Diab in C tier for the time being. That ranking might change later if uh, I decide to reassess. Aintree shared the British Grand Prix with Silverstone between 1955 and 1962 and raced within the grounds of the horse racing circuit. So you went through like gates and stuff as well. Honestly, um, I'd recommend driving Aintree uh, as a mod track and a sim if you haven't already. I believe it should be available for Assetto Corsa or the original R Factor. Um, it's an entertaining track. I quite like it, but it doesn't really jump out to me as something that, that is truly fantastic. So um, I would say we'll, we'll, we'll put you in C tier, you know, like right in the middle. C tier is tracks that fulfill their function as a racetrack. And, um, and you know, you, you don't really have any good reason to get rid of them, I suppose. D tier is, is for tracks that are like, yeah, okay. Like they work as racetracks, but you'd rather not have them on the calendar. Albert Park. Okay, this is uh, this is my Aussie bias showing once again. Um, I, I I like both layouts of Albert Park, and I really think that the 2022 one is um, the better of the two, but not by much. Um, I. I don't think Albert Park is really a patch on Adelaide in terms of, you know, the, the, the spectacle that it had and, you know, Adelaide just had a vibe to it that Melbourne was never quite able to recapture. But the Australian Grand Prix at Albert Park is still a fantastic event. It's still a really awesome circuit to watch cars go around and to drive in racing games and sims. I reckon I'm going to put Albert Park uh, B tier, both layouts. Now, Understorp. This is uh, an interesting one. This track hosted the Swedish Grand Prix in the 1970s, and my first experience of it in a racing sim was in Simbin's Race 07, the official World Touring Car Championship game, because this race hosted the World Touring Car Championship uh, in 2007. I suppose Understorp in an F1 sense is most infamous as the track where the, uh, the Brabham fan car in uh, the late 1970s uh, 
one, and um, that car was shortly banned thereafter. So that's Understorp's main claim to fame. I, I like Understorp, it's a pretty good track. It's It's got some beautiful flowing corners, all of those um, 180 degree bends that you see at the, uh, uh, well, I suppose it's the start of the lap because the pit lane and start finish line were in different spots rare for an F1 track. Um, those corners are banked, so you can carry a lot of speed through them, and there's so much speed you can carry through loads of the corners at this racetrack. Uh, I, I really do enjoy it. I think I would put Understorp in the B pretty good tier as well, and I think uh, all three of the layouts can go there. Honestly, it, it, lo looks, it looks like I'm putting all layouts of a circuit on the same tier, but I don't think that's going to be the case for some tracks we're looking at later on. Oh boy, Avus. Host of the German Grand Prix in 1959, and uh, man, this this was a this was a hell of a circuit. This two sides of the autobahn, or you know, a highway in Berlin, with a giant banked corner at the other end. Um, <laughs> it was a it was a bit of a literal wall of death at some points back in the day. Um, but as a Formula One circuit, I think there's a very good reason that they only raced here once. This track was uh, really too dangerous, even for the 19. 1950s, so it, mm, I don't know. I understand, you know, it's it's like a cathedral of speed and uh, some of the architecture from when races happen, like the grandstands and the, the control tower and all that are still there and it's a great piece of racing history. But as a racetrack, I think there's a lot that's actually better than it. So I'm really sorry, Avus. I'm probably gonna piss off a few people here. Uh, Avus is going to be my first D tier track. Now we get to Bahrain. This is the first track where I'm going to put different layouts in different tiers. We'll start with the 2005 to present layout. There is only one difference between the 2004 and the current layouts. Uh, turn four, the uh, second hairpin was um, actually a lot sharper when the track first opened and it was reprofiled to be made faster in 2005. I only started watching Formula One in 2007, but initially I wasn't too hot on Bahrain. It initially seemed like another one of those, you know, cookie cutter, tilkadrome kind of tracks. Oh, long straight into hairpin, into squiggly bit. Oh, no. But it's really grown on me, especially in recent years. I think that Bahrain has proved itself uh, now to be one of the better tracks of the modern era. The current layout of Bahrain, I will put in A tier. Yes. 2004, eh, I, I don't know. I feel like the track kind of loses something with the tighter turn four. So I'm gonna put it in, um, still in B tier. I think it, uh, it was still a pretty good track looking back on things despite its uh, initial frosty reception. 2010. Ugh, I, 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 bad memories just come to the surface looking at this thing. For context, if you're not aware, the 2010 Bahrain Grand Prix ran the endurance layout of the circuit because it was it was Formula One's 60th anniversary and they wanted to do something special, I guess. It turned out to be like the least special race ever. 2010 was such a hype pre-season as well. You had Michael Schumacher coming back for Mercedes. You had Alonso moving to Ferrari. However, all of that build up in the pre-season just went just this this big damp squib of a race. There was barely any passing at all. Yeah, it was it was just a really horrible choice of a track to race at. It was painful watching cars go around there. Unfortunately, Bahrain 2010 is gonna be my first F. Absolutely horrendous track. The 2020 outer layout on the other hand, the Sakir Grand Prix, oh wow, that was that was pretty awesome. I know that it uses a small piece of the endurance layout extension, but I think it's actually the part that flows a little better, and uh, I think it was it was just such a wacko circuit. <laughs> Super high speed, sub one minute lap times, some ridiculous battles, and who can forget Checo, his first win ever after so many years of trying. I cried at that finish. It was so good to see. I'm going to put Bahrain Outer from 2020 right up there with the main layout in A tier. Absolutely loved it. Now Baku is an interesting one. 
I remember the reception this track got when it was first announced and people first saw the track map, at least among fans. Uh, it was... it was... not nice. And despite a few teething issues, <coughs> drain covers, <coughs> um, it actually turned out to be alright in my opinion. I think it has its merits, but I don't think it uh, has had quite enough time to really prove itself as a, as a good street circuit. So for now I'm going to put it in C tier. Brands Hatch, now we're talking. This track shared the British Grand Prix with Silverstone from the mid 60s to the mid 80s and uh, it's a legendary track for a reason. It's so good. Just fantastic layout, flowing, follows the terrain. It, it has so much going for it, uh, except um, runoff areas and general safety for Formula One, especially nowadays. But it was certainly spectacular to watch the turbo cars go around it. I really love watching classic footage from the F1 races at Brands Hatch. And the legend Murray Walker himself said why they continue to race at Silverstone when they have a perfectly fantastic track at Brands Hatch is beyond me. I would say I somewhat agree, Murray. I'm going to put Brands Hatch in A tier. Both layouts, 64 to 74 and 76 to 86 when they uh, reprofiled the, uh, the back edge of the um, sort of paddock section. Bremgarten is another circuit that I'm not entirely familiar with. I have raced online on it in R Factor 2, but it was a conversion from a Grand Prix Legends mod that was a really terrible representation of the track. If you're looking for an experience of Bremgarten that's uh, as accurate as possible to how it actually was, I'd recommend Fat Alfie's uh, Bremgarten track mod for Assetto Corsa. It's a beautiful piece of work and really shows how uh, high speed and dangerous dangerous this circuit was. Of course its time was cut short by the 1955 Le Mans disaster and uh, Switzerland's uh, ban on um, internal combustion engine motorsports which continues to this day. I think Bremgarten belongs in B tier. I think it was a pretty good track especially for the time if only it was a little bit safer for the drivers. Buenos Aires, Argentinian Grand Prix. This has had a few different iterations. I am not sure how to rank most of them. Because the only one I really have any experience on in terms of driving is uh, the 1974 to 1981 layout. Uh, I first experienced that in the Grand Prix 1979 mod for R Factor 1 and I loved lapping around it. It's got some great high speed sections to start with, uh, followed by a very twisty section at the very end. Um, not much in the way of elevation change, there is a little bit of a dip towards the end, but I think by and large it was a pretty good track for racing. I think I'll put the 74 to 81 layout in B tier. Uh, the 1953 to 1960 layout, mm, I don't know, because like the big difference between that and the following one is that there was less of a run to the final hairpin. Other than that, they were pretty much the same circuit. I would say that the lack of the very fast round the lake section um, sort of acts as a bit of a minus point towards these layouts. So I'm going to put them in C tier. And the final iteration of the track, 95 to 98, mm, I don't know, it's, it's really not a patch on the old layouts at all. Very twisty, very compact. I don't really like it as much as the other layouts. I might put it in D. Sorry, Buenos Aires. Caesar's Palace, 1981 to 1982. I'm glad we could come to an understanding. Now we get to Catalonia, Barcelona, whatever you want to call it. Montmelo, that's where it actually is. Plenty of layouts to rank here. Um, this track, I think, is one that had like a, a gradual fall in terms of how much I liked the layout, and then it just shot back up in the last couple of years. Catalonia has a reputation as a boring track nowadays, primarily because that's where a lot of the Formula One tests take place, but when it opened in 1991, it was considered a really good racetrack, and I still enjoy the 1991 layout. Um, particularly, you know, it's it's got the classic final sector, and it's also got that chicane in the middle of the lap, you know, right after the fast right-hander at the top of the hill, which I think added a little bit of uh, an extra... Uh, woo-woo to the layout. That makes no sense. 
I like it. I think I think I think it goes uh, into into B tier. 1994. Now, this is the first of the tracks we're coming across where uh, we have to deal with the temporary modifications that were made after the unfortunate passing of uh, Ayrton Senna and Roland Ratzenberger. Temporary chicanes put in at uh, a lot of the venues that followed the San Marino Grand Prix in 94. And for Catalonia, uh, the tyre chicane was placed right before the chicane I was talking about just before. I understand why they did it, but it absolutely broke the flow of a, of a lovely fast and flowing circuit. And uh, maybe it was a bit of a knee-jerk reaction. Who knows? We'll, we'll never really know for sure how the season would have gone if they'd never made those modifications. Regardless, I think it should go in D tier just because of the tyre chicane. 95 to 2003, um, well it's basically the same as the original layout minus the uh, middle of the lap uh, fast S-bend chicane thingy, so I think I'm going to put it in the same tier, B. 2004 to 2006, the final hairpin was tightened. Um, let's uh, see where we should put this. I might put it in C tier just cause, you know, uh, I, I feel like I did still like it, but not as much as uh, these two layouts up here. And then we get to the big one. 2007, that final chicane, Jesus Christ. Honestly, uh, pfft, at the risk of sounding facetious, I think that that final sector of Catalonia for, for that length of time was even worse than the one-off 1994 tire chicane. Blech, I, 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 I don't really like it, sorry. It's, that's that's an F tier track for me. I absolutely hate that final sector. In 2021, the final hairpin was reprofiled and uh, sort of brought back to an in-between um, from the hairpin to the old sort of sweeping faster curve that used to be there, um, largely for motorcycle racing. So um, I think that was a plus point in the track's favor, but that final chicane is still there, not quite enough to lift it. That's going in D tier. And then this year, in 2023, they brought back the real final sector. I remember th the feeling I got when I read that announcement. I was like, be gone, foul beast. Back whence you came. You're banished forever. And I think, you know, it's, it's, not, it's still not quite an A-tier track, but I think it belongs in the higher echelons of B-tier. Charade, Clément Ferrand. I probably butchered that pronunciation, sorry to any Frenchies watching. Je t'aime. This was sort of classified as the French Nürburgring. Uh, a big portion of it is now public roads, but the bottom section, the sort of twistier looking bit, um, is now a permanent racetrack of its own with a, with a sort of link road section that contains a few chicanes. And um, pretty entertaining track, uh, having driven it on a, a few different racing simulators. Clermont Ferrand was a legendary circuit and for very good reason. Uh, it was also considered incredibly dangerous and for very good reason. All of that being said, I think it belongs in A tier just cause it's fantastic. One of those hybrid uh, open road course and racetrack venues that I just have a real soft spot for. Another modern venue, Kota. Let's see where we put you. Coda's another track that I have kind of mixed feelings on. Um, I really love the first half of the lap. I think it's fantastic. Um, and uh, it's certainly produced some very exciting races ever since it joined the Formula One calendar in 2012. And it's always good to see the United States Grand Prix on the calendar. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's a good track, especially for a modern venue that was at least partially designed by Herman Tilke. After careful consideration, I feel like Kota is, uh, if not a very high B tier, probably a lower A tier track in my opinion. It's, it's very enjoyable to watch racing at, and uh, I think if they can keep the bumps from getting too bad, it has a very bright future ahead of it. Oh, we're deep in America now. Dallas, 1984, one-off Dallas Grand Prix at a street circuit in Fair Park. This was a very infamous race. It was defined by super high temperatures and the track surface breaking up. 
In fact, wasn't wasn't the 84 Dallas Grand Prix the race where Nigel Mansell pushed his car across the line and then collapsed from heat stroke? Please correct me if I'm thinking about a different race, but I'm pretty sure it was Dallas. If you look at the layout alone, I suppose it's not bad for a 1980s street circuit. I feel like it's probably not really Formula One worthy though. And we never would have found out if this was the case, but uh, if it had stayed in Formula One for a few more years, I doubt it would have lasted beyond that. Maybe it's for the best that Dallas was a one-off. I think I'm going to put it in D tier. It is certainly one of the racetracks of all time. Detroit. Motor City. Oh boy. My first memory of this track was driving a modded version of it in the Formula One 1988 mod for R Factor One. And I found myself enjoying it in bits and pieces, but it is still very much an American street circuit through and through in a very American sort of grid city. The majority of the corners are right angle. Um, you're basically just driving around city blocks. There's a couple interesting bits in the first sector, a couple of, uh, you know, sweepers going into kinks, going into braking zones. Um, but I feel like by and large, kind of a forgettable track in my opinion. I think I would put it in C tier if only for uh, just being one of the tracks where we saw plenty of, uh, of racing in the 1980s. And that's for the second iteration of the layout. The first, oh no, what is that protrusion? Yeah, when they initially designed this track, they figured putting a really slow hairpin right at the start of the lap would make it more like Monaco. Um, and I guess it did in the worst possible way. Cars could barely even get around the hairpin. I think that this is uh, probably an F tier for that corner alone. Seriously, look up some photos of it. It's disgusting. Dijon Crenoir. This track is most famous as the scene of that fantastic last lap battle between Gilles Villeneuve and uh, René Arnoux. Dijon, though short, is a really nice flowing circuit and it has an interesting layout that can be very difficult to get right. Uh, I think the, uh, the full layout with the hairpin will uh, probably go in B tier. And the uh, original layout, 1974, a little bit shorter, probably in C tier. I, th I think the track's a bit better with the hairpin extension. Donington Park. Let's go. I love this track. A shame that it only hosted one Grand Prix, uh, but it was a hell of a Grand Prix that it hosted. Senna's first laps in the wet. That is, that is like, uh, you know, everyone needs to know about that if you want to get into Formula One. And it's got some beautiful corners. Like the whole section from Redgate to Coppice is just art in racetrack form. I, I adore it. You know what? I'm calling it. I think Donington, 1993, even with the tight chicane at the Fogarty S's, uh, will be my first S-tier track of this video. Congratulations, Donington. I love you. Now we get to East London, Prince George Circuit, the first track that hosted the South African Grand Prix. Another track that I'm not too well versed in, but I know enough about the layout to know that it's certainly fast. It's certainly got a bit of challenge to it. You have to be careful on the brakes for those tight hairpins at either end of the lap. And a nice flowing uh, sort of S-ish section right in the middle. I like East London. I like the look of it. It's probably, uh, probably not quite uh, a or B tier though. I reckon it's uh, it's on the high end of C. It's it's okay. It's on the verge of being. Hey, this is good. Estoril. Now, if if you're familiar with my Super Serious Track Guide series, you will know that I'm not a huge fan of the current layout of this track. I'm sure it'll either sharpen your recommended, or if I can be bothered, I'll put a card up here. To, so you can watch that video. It's it's one of my favorite videos I've done. But when they put that chicane in at Estoril in 1994, it uh, I, I think that's one of the worst design chicanes ever. It's slow, it's tight, it's awkward, it's, it's just, it's way too easy to overdrive. I think the second layout of Estoril, um, I mean, you know, in spite of that chicane, probably, uh, 
goes in C tier. Meanwhile, the original layout, I'm going to put in B tier because, um, you know, it's it's certainly been the scene of some really fantastic races as well. Um, Senna's storming drive in the wet in, I think, 1985. And in its original form, Estoril was uh, a fast circuit that was certainly quite challenging for the driver. Fuji, here we go. This is a track I have a difficult relationship with. I first encountered Fuji Speedway on Gran Turismo 4, and uh, when I found out that it hosted Formula One in the 1970s, I thought, holy shit, this is, uh, this is, this is one hell of a track. And then I found out about the circumstances in 1976, just how wet monsoon weather it had. And, and I mean, if you, if you want the full story of that race, just watch the climax of Rush. The track becoming a river aside, I think the original layout of Fuji is, uh, was, was a really good racetrack. This is probably the, the Gran Turismo 4 fanboy in me speaking, but I think I'll put the original layout of Fuji up here. And when I say original, I mean original for Formula One. I know that uh, there was uh, an original, original layout of Fuji that had this really crazy bank turn that was incredibly dangerous. Maybe that's a story for another time. But then we get to the second iteration of Fuji that hosted the Japanese Grand Prix in 07 and 08. Now, as I mentioned, I started watching Formula One in 2007 and... Um, this was after I got into racing games and encountered Fuji for the first time in GT4 when I drove Fuji 2005 for the first time. In fact, not even driven. When I scrolled over to the track selection screen and saw the map of Fuji 2005 for the first time, I just thought, what the fuck? It's one of the most egregious disfigurements of a racetrack I've ever seen, and I, I roasted the heck out of it in another super serious track guide, which, uh, hey, let, let's see if the card works this time. If not, it'll be down in the description. I didn't like it. And, uh, I mean, I suppose my opinion has softened a little bit in recent years. It's, it's not, it's not the worst track ever, but compared to what it originally was, it's like, you know, man, come on. I think this line from the Super Serious Track Guide sums up my feelings on this track. On a track that has been known for decades as a temple of speed, why the ever-loving fuck would you make it a go-kart track in the final sector? D tier for you, Hockenheim. This is where my opinion might get uh, a little bit um, controversial. I think that the current layout of Hockenheim is better for racing than the original Blast Through the Forest. Please don't murder me. I, it's, it's, it's just how I feel. I understand why the original layout of Hockenheim is so legendary, but the fact is it, it probably wasn't going to survive into the current era of Formula One in any case. I do wish that they had kept the old track there uh, and not uh, pulled it up completely and planted trees, but I do enjoy the current layout, probably for different reasons than I do the old one. The 1970 to 1981 layout, no chicane at Ostkurve and the chicanes that were there were pretty quick. I think I might put that in a uh, B tier along with the 82 to 91 and 92 to 93 layouts. The 94 to 2001 layout, I think I might put it in A tier because I think the tightening up of the um, final chicane uh, introduced another overtaking opportunity. Um, and, you know, this this was in the era of the V10s, you know, they were trimming out the wings to get the maximum speed down the straights. You see drivers fighting with the cars coming into the final stadium section. Pretty much every braking zone is a passing opportunity. It's got lots of long straights for slip streaming. It is a fantastic track, but as I mentioned, I do like the current layout just a little bit more. Yes, I know it was unpopular. Yes, I know it m maybe won't be a patch on the old layout for many Formula One fans, especially older ones, but I feel like it just works better as a racing venue in the context of current year. Sort of makes me wish it was still on the calendar. We haven't seen a race there since 2019. 
The Hungaro Ring. This is an underrated circuit for me. I know that over the years it had gained a bit of a reputation as a track where, you know, you couldn't pass and you couldn't follow through the quick corners and whatever else, but I always just love watching racing here just to see the physical capabilities of Formula One cars. Lewis Hamilton's pole lap from 2020 is still one of the most spectacular single Formula One laps I have ever seen. I like Hungaro Ring, and I'm going to put it in mm, A tier, but it's on the lower part of A tier, sort of edging into B tier. The 1989 to 2002 layout, on the other hand, mm, well, it probably wasn't as easy to pass around there. Uh, one advantage that the current layout does have is it's got the first turn a lot tighter with a longer run up to it, and uh, also the uh, third last turn is uh, it has a lot simpler of an approach, and it's a proper braking zone, and you actually see passes into there occasionally. That wasn't really the case with the uh, sort of original layout of the track. I think I'm going to put it into C tier. And the first time they raced at the Hungaro Ring, they had a chicane at turn four, and it wasn't pretty. That is a D tier track for me. Imola, Imola, Imola. Oh dear. Here's the thing. This track will forever be known as the circuit that killed Senna and Ratzenberger, and the modifications it underwent in 1995 sort of set the tone for how Formula One circuits in general are designed today. But I still think, in all of its forms, Imola is a pretty damn good circuit. I mean, I think, I think I'm just going to make a blanket statement here. Um, I think that all layouts of Imola are A tier. All of them. Every single one. I, I don't think I'd be able to pick a favorite out of the five of them that I have here. The 1980 and 81 to 94 layouts, obviously iconic for the run to uh, down to Tosa from Tamburello, 81 to 94 with uh, with a chicane at Aqua Minerale. The 95 to 2005 layout, the chicane at uh, Variante Alta was quicker than it was uh, in the later layout from 2006. But I like both of them for uh, different reasons. I think, you know, I, I like the quick flick that the original Variante Alta was, um, but I also like the flow uh, seeing cars go through the 2006 to present iteration of that corner. And I think it was one of the better decisions in the track's history to remove the chicane at Variante Bassa and return the start-finish stretch to this long, flat-out blast down to Tamburello. I just think Imola, like the Hungaro Ring, is a track that, uh, that really shines when um, you watch an onboard and you see just how hard the driver is pushing and see just what a Formula One car is capable of. How's about Indianapolis? Well, as I mentioned in the preamble, I've got the oval here, uh, only for a technicality. I think that, uh, it, I, I reckon I, I should just put it in C tier because, like, it's, it's an anomaly. It's kind of its own thing, and I don't really know what, what to really do with it. I mean, it's Indianapolis Motor Speedway. What more can you say? The 2000 to 2007 road course layout, on the other hand, well, I think we can all remember Indianapolis 2005, the absolute debacle that that was. And I feel like it just really wasn't a very interesting road course anyway. I reckon I, I'd put it in, I'd put it in D tier, if I'm completely honest. That double hairpin section in the middle of the lap is just kind of bleh. Into Lagos. Now, I will go straight ahead and put the 1990 to the present layout in S tier because it is just a magnificent track in, <laughs> you know, any year from 1990 to now. I love watching cars go around it. It always provides great racing. It's been the scene of some incredible title deciders, 2007 and 2008, come on. 
and it, and it retains a lot of that old school charm, which I really like. Speaking of old school, how about the original layout of Interlagos, built in the late 1940s, first hosted the Brazilian Grand Prix in 1973. This track was an absolute monster, seven plus Ks long, and a tight, twisting maze of, of hairpins and straights and sweepers, and oh man, it was so good. We need more tracks like that. We need more tracks like Original Interlagos. I'm putting that in A tier. Istanbul. This circuit, I did a slightly serious showcase on it, the, the series where I praise racetracks instead of roast them. Um, I, I, I feel like Istanbul, the main thing that's going for it is turn eight. Um, the, you know, I mean, multi-apex, left-hander, taken almost flat out, super high speed. Um, it, it will forever remain the track where Lewis Hamilton took his seventh title as well, with that incredible drive in the rain turning intermediate tires into slicks. I think as far as Tilkadromes go, it's one of the better ones, and I've seen a lot of people praise it over the years, I would have to agree. I think Istanbul Park will go into A tier. Jacare Pagua. As far as tracks to host the Brazilian Grand Prix go, this one I don't think really has a patch on Interlagos. I'm sorry for anyone who lives in Rio de Janeiro, but uh, yeah, that's just how I feel. I think Seo Paulo has one on you uh, on this one. It functions as a racetrack. It's okay, I guess. In fact, that's exactly the description of C tier, so that's where it will go. Arama. Host of the Spanish Grand Prix in the 60s and 70s, and once more in 1981. The only change of layout was uh, the uh, the hairpin was sort of cut off a little bit towards the end of the lap. At least that's uh, what I've seen. This track was mostly famous, I think, for how difficult it was to pass at. And you're talking about difficult to pass in the 60s and 70s. That's really saying something. Famously at one Grand Prix at Harama, Gilles Villeneuve managed to hold behind an entire pack of cars for the whole race and none of them could make a move on him. I feel like Harama really belongs in D tier. Both layouts. It's, it's a bit too tight and twisty for a Formula One circuit, even for an era that's nearly 50 years gone by. Jeddah, oh dear. You know, I have a confession to make. Jeddah was one of the tracks that I initially forgot to include in this tier list. I had had, I had all of the image files sorted, I was ready to go, and I realized, hang on a minute, Wikipedia says 77 tracks have hosted Formula One races. I've only got 75 here, what am I missing? Second confession, Istanbul was one of them. Oh god. I can't, I, I can't believe I did that. But Jeddah, I'm not surprised I forgot about, because I'm not a huge fan of it. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the layout in isolation, it's got some really interesting technical sections, and it's got plenty of opportunities for the drivers to push and show what they can really do. But when you think about the proximity of the walls in these super high-speed sections, making it quite a dangerous track, and the occasional missile strike, I suppose those are minus points uh, to put towards that track. I, I think Jeddah is, uh, is, is D tier for now. We'll see if it gets downgraded to an F as time goes on. Maybe that's not entirely fair to Jeddah though, because, you know, it definitely gives the drivers a chance to show off. Max Verstappen's pole lap that never was in 2021. I think maybe that will be the only real highlight of this track's history. Alright, time to rate the Circuito Permanente de Jerez. I'm a fan of Jerez. I, I, think it's a, I think it's a pretty damn good track. Here's a video recommendation for you. It's probably up on YouTube still. Uh, search for Ayrton Senna's 1990 pole lap at Jerez. It is, some of, it is one of the best displays of driving I have ever seen. And it's the reason I fell in love with the original layout of Jerez that is a little bit twistier than the second layout that they had. It's plenty of challenge uh, around Jerez. Certainly love it. And uh, I think I will put the current uh, Grand Prix layout in there as well. 94 and 97. Uh, 
you know, the old title decider between Villeneuve and Schumacher. Kyle Army, South African Grand Prix. I think this one will be pretty easy. Kyle Army is a classic circuit and for a very good reason. It's original layout, super fast and super fun as well. Uh, it has been the scene of a couple of um, pretty awful accidents like that of Tom Price in 1977. But all up, I think that purely as a racetrack, purely as a layout, it's simple, fast, fun. I would put the original layout of Kyle Army in S tier, personally. The second time F1 raced at Kyle Army though, 92 and 93, I mean, half of it is the original layout, but it lost a lot of its original character. I still think it's a pretty good racetrack, but not as good as the track it once was. I reckon I'd put it in C tier. Las Vegas Strip from this year. I don't know what to think. You know, I, I think it's probably a little bit early to make a true judgment on it because like the race has really only just happened. There were a lot of things to think about at the Grand Prix weekend this year. You know, the drain covers being lifted. You know, that's happened at a few circuits before. Why weren't they prepared for it this time? Uh, the cold track temperatures making the track really slippery. Lando Norris's huge crash, etc., etc., etc. I think I might go the middle of the road option and put it in C tier for the time being. If I redo this tier list later, potentially, it could move up or down. It depends. Le Mans Bugatti, 1967. The track that uh, was so poorly received that Papyrus's Grand Prix Legends, which simulates the 1967 F1 season, does not include this track. It of course uses the start finish straight and first turn of the Le Mans 24 hour circuit and um, I guess they thought it was a good idea to race there for the French Grand Prix in 1967. But apparently this track is the reason we use the term Mickey Mouse to describe uh, tracks that are, you know, a little bit bleh, a little bit twisty and bland and uh, whatever else. I mean, you can imagine being an F1 driver or fan in the late 1960s and going to the Bugatti circuit, which was a pretty modern motorsport venue, uh, and just being underwhelmed at the simplicity of the layout. I wouldn't put it in F tier though. I think I think it's still it's still functional as a racetrack. Still had some good overtaking opportunities. Um, just an interesting footnote in F1 history. D tier for the Bugatti circuit. One of my favorite street circuits of all time. It's time for Long Beach. Now there's three layouts to choose from here for uh, when Formula One raced at Long Beach. Um, and I think we'll go in historical order. The first one, 1976 to 1981, um, certainly had its merits, had some uh, big uh, elevation changes up the top of the track at the north end where the start finish, uh, well sorry, where the finish line and pits were. I don't show it on my maps, but the, uh, the actual start line was uh, on short shoreline drive before the uh, long right hand bend. Another oddity among Formula One circuits. I'd say the first sector is maybe a bit too twisty and um, yeah, I don't know. I, 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 I certainly don't like any of these layouts as much as I like the current layout of Long Beach. I think that layout is the best the track has ever been. But for this one, I'll probably put it in C tier. 1982, well, it's a bit of the best of both worlds, I suppose. It has um, the, well, actually, no, uh, scratch that. I just saw 1983, hang on, we'll, we'll, we'll get to that. Um, 1982, I, I do like what it does with the first sector. I think I would put it in B tier, personally. And 1983, well, it keeps the interesting first sequence of turns, but then it adds some really weird kind of twisty sections and that final chicane just looks like hell. I feel like that belongs in D tier. I'm really sorry, but uh, that just be how I feel. Oh, Qatar. 
another track I've done a super serious track guide on, so you probably know what my feelings are on this circuit. The myriad problems the track had this year aside, the bloody, the, 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 the curbs and the repainting of the curbs and the, the tires and whatever else, I just feel like it's a much better bike circuit than it is a Formula One circuit, and I feel like it really doesn't belong. I think a very low D tier, like on the verge of edging into F. It's not quite as bad as, uh, as Bahrain 2010 or Caesars Palace, but uh, it's, it's not that far above either. Manicourt is another underrated track, in my opinion. Yes, it was in the middle of nowhere, it was hard to get to, and uh, you know, it wasn't very popular among Formula One personnel, but as a racetrack, I think it's simply beautiful. It's got a lovely flowing layout, which I really enjoy, and the I will stand by this. The opening corners of Manicourt, the flat-out double left-hander going into the long sweeping right, onto the back stretch, into the hairpin, I think that's just a fantastic sequence of racetrack, and uh, something that you should all experience on a racing sim if you're able to. It's just incredible when you get it right. And watching Formula One cars in the real world go through there is something else. The rest of the track though I think kind of balances it out. I mean it's it's got some beautiful flow to it and uh, you know a lot of nice high speed stuff. I think if the rest of the track was like the opening turns it would be an easy like high A to low S tier, but I think Manicore at the very least is high B tier, like edging on A for me. It's really good. That's where the 2003 to 2008 layout goes. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll put the 92 to 2002 layout in there as well. 1991 is brought down by the chicane after the hairpin. I, I don't know why the track was designed with that from the outset. It really seems unnecessary. Uh, that bumps it down to C tier for me. But hey, look, don't 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 be fooled by this. I really love Manicore, and as far as B tier tracks go, it's probably right up the top with uh, with Albert Park and and Bahrain for me. Mexico City, the Autodromo Hermanos Rodriguez. This is another track that I feel was kind of neutered, butchered, whatever, with recent redesigns. Like, I understand why the redesign had to happen in the way it did, uh, especially considering the speed of Formula One cars now, but there's just something about the 86 to 92 layout. There's this real charm to it that I don't think the current layout really has. The Peraltada turn, the final one, um, yes, dangerous. Of course. So I understand there having to be like a, a, you know, a chicane, a detour through a baseball stadium, what have you. But the reprofiling of the S's really sticks in my craw, personally. I would personally put the modern layout of Mexico City in D tier, but uh, 86 to 92, um, I reckon would probably go B tier. Uh, sort of mid to high B tier, just below Manicure, Albert Park, and whatever. And hell, same goes for the 1963 to 1970 layout as well. A couple of different sections, primarily turns one and two, and a little bit of an extra run to a super tight hairpin, which I presume drivers would have had a bit of trouble getting around. Miami, I don't really know how to feel about Miami. I suppose I don't mind the first part of the lap, there's some, there's some nice challenge to it and it's entertaining to watch drivers try to tackle those decreasing radius bends, but the track is super let down by the middle section going under the, the highway bridge and all that, the, the hairpin going into the slow section and the chicane and ugh, I don't, ugh, don't like it. I think on balance for me, Miami is a D tier track. Ugh, I have not been looking forward to this one. Monaco. How many layouts do we have here? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 layouts to rank. Jesus. I suppose we can start from the present and work backwards. 
let's be honest, Monaco is not suitable for the current generation of Formula One. And I don't think it has been for uh, 30, maybe even 40 years. It's one of those holdovers from the historic gilded age of racing that just will not die uh, because of money and glamour and rich people on yachts. But strip all of the history and the glamour and the, the, the money away and what are you left with? You're left with a super tight track that's super narrow, outright dangerous in places and is pretty much impossible to pass at. I reckon the 2015 to present layout where the uh, the inside of uh, the Tabak corner exit was moved in by a few meters, um, that will go in mm, D tier. So will 2003 to 2014, um, so will 97 to 2002. Um, and when we get to 1986 to 1996, things start to get a little, um, a little more open, I think. As I think Monaco got way worse as cars got quicker. Cars just outgrew the circuit by the mid 1970s. So I suppose maybe um, 86 to 96 and 76 to 85, they are um, sort of higher D tier. Uh, probably on the verge of C. The difference from 85 to 86 was that the chicane uh, assumed its current form. It used to be a very quick sort of flick left and right uh, down by the bay. And for the life of me, I can't remember what the difference between 73 to 74 and 1975 was. I, I had a reason for separating those as different layouts. I think it had to do with the specific positioning of uh, the chicane. I don't really, I, don't, I, I just want to get this over and done with. I think, I think I'll just put these layouts of Monaco in C tier, 68 to 71, um, 63 to 67 there as well in C. And uh, I think in sort of high C tier to low B tier, um, I'll put the original layouts of Monaco um, because I suppose at the very least it was a little more, uh, the cars of the era were a little more suited to it. They were slow enough that they didn't feel like they had outgrown the track. I feel like with all the extra corners it has now, the track is even too small for horse and cart racing. But now we get back to fun times. Monsanto! Monsanto hosted the Portuguese Grand Prix in 1959, and looking at the map, you'd think, yeah, okay, it looks all right, but then you look at it on Google Earth with terrain turned on, and my God, the scenery around there. Monsanto has a lovely flowing layout from what I can see, some fantastic elevation changes, and uh, some beautiful sections that would have made for fantastic viewing. I'm sure from the driver's perspective it must have been pretty good too, or maybe not considering I read that apparently the surface was very rough and drivers even went over tram lines. But I feel like on the base of having never directly experienced the track myself, um, I might put Monsanto in B tier, probably a high B tier. I like it. I wish it was available for a racing sim so I could give it a try. Montuic Park. This is another track that I love driving on on Sims. Uh, I think as far as street circuits go, it's probably one of the best flowing, most spectacular ones. Has plenty of danger, sure, especially along the, uh, the front section. Coming up to the hairpin, there's this massive jump. Um, but aside from that, really good track in my opinion. I would put it high B tier. Oh, hello baby. I absolutely adore the Circuit Gilles Villeneuve in Montreal. It's one of the tracks that I first, when, when I was first getting into Formula One and looking up YouTube footage of uh, the F106 PlayStation 2 game by Psygnosis, um, it was um, my sort of wake up call to how quick Formula One cars really are. I've always liked the flow of the Circuit Gilles Villeneuve. I've always liked the overtaking opportunities it offers. And, um, you know, as, as as an Australian, 
I like Canada. I like the idea of going to Canada. I think if I were to attend any Formula One race, the Canadian Grand Prix would be one of them. I, I, I take, take me to Montreal and feed me poutine. I think in its current form, since 2002, Montreal is, come on, scroll up, scroll up, S. Welcome to the club, Montreal. Enjoy the drinks. Now I gotta think about where to put all the rest of the layouts. I reckon every one of them uh, is at least a track that I rate very highly. 96 to 2001, that's A tier. 94 to 95, now there was the introduction of a temporary chicane here once again, which kind of ruined the flow of the track. I think that would bring it down to C tier, but it's still a very high C tier. I might do a little bit of reordering of, uh, of tracks within the tiers just to make sure that my ratings are consistent. 91 to 93. I really love watching cars go through the section after the Lepang Le Hairpin. Um, you know, this sort of kinky S-bend thingamajig that takes you onto the back straight. I think that layout of Montreal is, uh, is, is just as good as the current one. I would put that in A tier as well. Same for 1988 to 1990, the layout uh, before the... Um, final chicane and the wall of champions was really introduced. And the first two layouts of Montreal, well, they were a lot twistier than the track is now. I, I actually can't believe that, you know, I always marvel at the fact that Montreal is one of the few race tracks where it's actually gotten less twisty over time. That said, I'd probably put both of them in B tier. Uh, not quite as good as uh, the track from 88 to 2001 and uh, not a patch on the way the track is now. Oh, I love you Montreal, mon ami. Speaking of Quebec, uh, Mont-Tremblant. I love this track, completely honestly. I've driven it plenty on racing sims and uh, it is a spectacular circuit. The run down from the flowing turn one to the uh, S-bend at turns two and three is uh, simply magnificent and it's got some lovely flow to it. I reckon Mont Tremblant um, is not, not as good as Montreal in my opinion. Uh, I mean, it definitely has elevation change on Montreal which really gives it points, um, but I think... Uh, this, this is going to be tough. It's, it's a B tier track, but it's a very high B tier. Edging on A. Now we get to the true cathedral of speed, Monza. This is another one of those tracks that I, that I, you know, I love just as much as anyone who's a Formula One fan. But I feel like in this day and age, there are better tracks. I know that's a bit of a prickly statement to make. Look, it's, it's all about high speed and slipstreaming. And that's good. I I feel like Monza is a high A tier track, but not quite an S tier. If if we were judging on history alone, it would easily be S tier, right up there, right away. But I think, uh, in my opinion, it's it's more of an A tier. Still a fantastic circuit. So I put the current layout up in A tier. I think I might do the same with 95 to 99 with the original Retifilio Tribune. Uh, even the 94 layout with the um, slightly tightened Lesmo 2 is up there too. And hell, 76 to 93 as well. You know what? I think I think this might just be all A tiers for Monza. 74 to 75 is going up there too. Uh, 72 to 73, which was um, the initial introduction of the Ascari chicane before it was reprofiled for 1974. 57 to 71, that's the classic layout of Monza. No chicanes, just blasting all the way around. That is A tier as well. Dangerous, but spectacular. And I think you could say the same for the 10K layout that included the oval as well. And then we get to the 50 to 54 layout. This was before the Parabolica was built. The final two turns at Monza were sort of, you know, right angle, kind of stop start-ish end to the lap. But I think the circuit still had its essential character of being just a high speed slipstreaming venue. It's, 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 it's a fantastic track, which is exactly why it's an A tier. All iterations of Monza are fantastic. Oh, I think we've got another S tier on our hands in Mosport. 
now known as Canadian Tire Motorsport Park. This hosted the Canadian Grand Prix uh, intermittently between 1967 and 1977, and it is just a classic road course in every sense of the word. Interestingly, one of the few racetracks where the basic layout hasn't changed at all throughout its whole history. It was widened in the late 1990s, but apart from that, you're driving the exact same route that every driver who's ever raced at that track did. If you haven't driven most sport in a racing game, I sincerely suggest you do. It is such an incredible track. High speed corners, long straights, short-ish lap, it's S tier. Uh, one of the 2020 one-off tracks, Mugello. I was looking forward to this track a lot when it was announced for the 2020 calendar. Of course, I think the big thing that most of us remember Mugello for is that uh, huge um, start-finish straight pile-up in 2020. But look, just watching an onboard around Mugello in a Formula One car, it, it, it made a lot of my dreams come true. I will personally put Mugello smack dab in the middle of A tier. All right, there we are. Uh, looks like that's a bit of an updated um, ranking that more accurately summarizes my uh, it, ideal order of all of these tracks. Now we can move on to the final run, okay. New Delhi, the Bud International Circuit. I think another underrated circuit. It's a shame that it didn't get a very good run at it. You know, F1 only raced there three times and Sebastian Vettel dominated all, all of those races. But I feel like Bud had a lot going for it. Uh, it had, you know, this really interesting middle sector, that super long right-hander that tightened at the exit, going uphill as well. Um, it was always spectacular watching cars go through those corners. The first part of the lap was pretty simple, but I think it was balanced out by uh, the rest of the track. So I reckon I'm going to put New Delhi, Bud International Circuit, probably smack dab in the middle of B tier. I put it, um, I wouldn't put it above Dijon, but I'd put it above Buenos Aires. Ugh, Nivelle Bowler, okay. I'm ap I apologize if I mispronounce that. Uh, this was probably one of the most forgettable F1 tracks of all time after they had to leave Spa because safety and for very good reason. Um, this was the track that hosted the Belgian Grand Prix twice in 72 and 74 and uh, it was just not a patch on many other tracks. For me, I'd put it above Harama, but still solidly in D tier. In fact, I'm going to do a little bit more adjusting here. Uh, I reckon um, what I said earlier about Monaco still holds true. I'm going to put those layouts right at the bottom of D tier. And then we get to one of the true classics, the Nürburgring Nordschleife. There's a lot to be said about, you know, the track being too long for Formula One, uh, even back in the day. And... Um, the, uh, the lack of safety that came with it. This is the track where Nicky Lauda had his big accident and I think it'll always be remembered for that. But I mean, come on, it's the Nürburgring. Where else are you gonna put it but S tier? 73 to 76 is up there, 67 to 72 as well. Um, the big difference between these two is, uh, what's, the, what's, what's, what's the name of this corner? Let me just look this up. I mean, I can, I can, I can drive the Nordschleife blindfolded, but I still don't know any of the the corner names apart from Hartzenbach, Bergwerk, uh, Grunholle, Metgesfeld. That's the name of the corner, Metgesfeld. Yeah, so Metgesfeld used to be a fast right-hander, but then they turned it into a kind of chicane in 1973. And I'll put the 51 to 66 layout up there as well, and I will place these. Hmm. And solidly in the middle of S tier. Then we get to the Grand Prix circuit, the, uh, the the modern Nürburgring. Obviously not a patch on the Nordschleife, but I still quite enjoy it, and I think it made for a very good racetrack in Formula One. I would put the Nürburgring Grand Prix circuit up the top of B tier, I think, or around the top. I think uh, in between Manicourt and Mont Tremblant. 
that's for the current layout of it. I'd probably rate the 2002 one a little bit higher because the final chicane was a little bit faster and more flowing. And I'll put the pre-95 circuit above them as well. Both, both layouts here, um, especially the first where the final chicane was even faster. But the big difference maker for me is the much simpler opening uh, two turns. I think that fast chicane is uh, a uh, very pleasurable bit of racetrack to observe. Everybody's got an opinion on Paul Ricard. I think the layout that was raced from 2018 to last year is, uh, well, I mean, I understand why people don't like it. Um, it's a bit dazzling on the eyes, but remember, those runoff areas are painted like they are because Paul Ricard is used as a test track and um, there's special sort of compounds in the asphalt, it's like, uh, it's like tungsten or something. And supposedly it, it helps to slow cars down and also is very harsh on tires too. Regardless, as a racetrack, I think it belongs down the bottom of C tier. The 86 to 1990 layout, probably I'd rate a little bit higher. I'd put it in between Estoril and Long Beach. And you know what? I think I would put this above Monaco. I'm probably doing a bit of a disservice to Paul Ricard by putting it below Monaco and Detroit. And the original layout, 71 to 85. I reckon that belongs mm, just above the shortened 86 to 90 layout. Pedralbes hosted the Spanish Grand Prix between 1951 and 1954. Unfortunately, could not be used after 1955 because of the 55 Le Mans disaster that uh, really made people go, hey, we should probably look at making racetracks a bit safer. This was a street circuit in Barcelona, and uh, it was a fan favourite and a driver favourite from what I've read. It certainly had lots of nice sweeping corners and a little bit of elevation change as well. Kind of went up the side of a hill. I would put it maybe just below Bremgarten, I think. Yeah, that seems like an appropriate place to put Pedralbas. Pescara, the longest track to ever host a Formula One Grand Prix. A uh, World Championship Grand Prix at the very least. Might put it around B, -b, 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 -b tier. I put it above Anderstorp, but I I prefer Montremblant over it if I had to choose between the two. Oh boy, Phoenix. Oh, this is this is one that I have kind of mixed feelings about as well. I mean, it is you know an American grid street circuit. It's full of right angle corners, but watching onboards, it actually looks like a pretty cool track. Just done a little bit of reordering. Put Aintree back there so that I can put Phoenix. Mm, yeah, above Estoril. Both layouts. I think I actually prefer the 91 layout over the 89 to 91. Algarve, Portimao, come on. Where else can I put this track but very high A tier to, I'd say low S tier actually. What a circuit this is. When it was first built, I, I saw the news articles around it and I thought, wow, you know, uh, if Formula One raced here, it would be an incredible experience as a spectator. And, uh, you know, some tests in 2009, finally got a race in 2020, raced there again last year. I hope it comes back because it, it's a it's a fantastic circuit. A prime example of a beautifully built, beautifully designed modern venue. Big ups for Portimao. Speaking of Portugal, we got Porto as well. The Circuito de Boa bit and it is late. The Circuito de Boa Vista. I haven't seen much of this track in the form that Formula One raced in in 1958 and 1960. My experience of Porto is the revival layout of the street circuit that the World Touring Car Championship raced on in 2007 and 2008. Once again, Simbin, Race 07, represent underrated racing sim. But it's quite a, it's, it's quite an awesome street circuit. It's got some high speed sections, it's got some twisties at the end of the lap, but you know, not too twisty, more like high speed S-bends. Uh, certainly looks like a nice circuit. And I think I would put it solidly uh, in the upper echelons of C tier, just behind 
uh, no, actually, on top of Montreal 94 to 95. And then we get to Rheims. This is, this is one of the tracks that English speakers always have a hard time pronouncing. So, so French people, if you're watching, is it, is it Reims, Reim, or something else? Educate me. This track is incredibly famous for its high speed layout and uh, it was it was certainly an awesome spot to watch racing in France. And much like Avus, it's, it's almost a museum nowadays. The old grandstands are still there. You can go and visit it and, uh, and just get a taste of what Grand Prix racing was like in the 50s and 60s. Super awesome track. The latter two layouts of it in its history, I would put in A tier. I reckon yeah, in between Adelaide and Bahrain, my, my Aussie bias is showing. I, I, will, I will prefer Adelaide over many other tracks. I put 53 just below it because the hairpins were tighter, average speeds were a little bit lower. And the 1950 to 1951 layout that actually went into the town of uh, Gu. I think I'm pronouncing that right. Probably not. Not quite as good as the uh, mid 50s to mid 60s layouts. I would put it in uh, probably B tier, just below the Hockenheim layouts. Riverside only hosted one United States Grand Prix in 1960. And this is one of the great lost classics of United States road racing. It's, uh, it's, it, there's a shopping mall where it used to be now, but it was a highly regarded circuit and for very good reasons. So I'm going to put it in A tier, probably, I'll put it above Fuji, below Imola in A tier. The, that opening sequence of air spins, Look up some old photographs of it. Look up some videos. Honestly, experience Riverside. It's a beautiful track. It's a shame it's gone now. Rouen Les Essars. Now, this is another classic French road circuit, and um, it was famous for its high speeds and its, uh, its twisting down to the cobblestone hairpin at the start of the lap. I, the, 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 I'm feeling A tier on this. I really am. I'd probably put it, is it, do I think it's better than Istanbul and Sharad? Is it better even than Imola? You know what? I think I'd take it over Imola, putting it just below Bahrain. The 1952 layout, mm, it was it was shorter, it kind of chopped things off, um, added a couple more slow corners to it. Uh, this for me is a high B tier track, probably put it in between Albert Park and Manicure purely because it keeps that spectacular opening section. How many times have I said spectacular in this video now? Um, if, if someone's bored enough, maybe they can count and put it in the comments. Yes, indeed. Formula One raced at Sebring in 1959. And Sebring is another classic United States road racing course. Uh, an airfield circuit, in fact. Um, I'm going to be making a track history video on Sebring after I'm done with the Silverstone one, which is almost done. I believe this is the track where uh, Jack Brabham won his first uh, Formula One title. So again, Aussie bias showing. Uh, Sir Jack is an idol of mine and I have to give love to Sebring because uh, it's the track that gave him his first championship even though he had to uh, push his car across the line. And I just love Sebring in general, any layout. Uh, so I am going to put it here, solidly in A tier. Ah, Sepang. Hello, my old friend. Uh, this is one of the tracks where if, if someone tells you Herman Tilke's a terrible circuit designer, show them Sepang. It's a beautiful racetrack with a beautiful layout and I love the flow of it. It's, it's fantastic in every single way. And A tier is fantastic tracks, so I'm going to put it there. I think, mm, do I or don't I? Do I or don't I? Mm, yes, yes I do. Sepang is at the top of A tier, would be an S tier circuit. Um, actually, I, 
I don't know what would make it S tier, but I don't know. It just it just seems like I uh, there are other tracks that really belong in S tier compared to Sepang, though there's absolutely nothing wrong with it in in my opinion. Oh, once again, hello my old friend, but a bit more sarcastic this time, Shanghai. This was another super serious track guide track. And look, my opinions have mellowed out a bit over the years. I, I, do, I don't hate Shanghai as much as I used to, but I still prefer a multitude of other tracks to it. I'm not saying that it's a terrible circuit, it's produced some good races, and it seems to be a favourite among quite a few fans. We haven't raced at it in a while as well, so maybe absence makes the heart grow fonder. I'll uh, I'll put it in a C tier, probably probably above Baku but below Catalonia 04 to 06. Then we get to the many layouts of Silverstone. Now you might notice that uh, there's a couple of. Uh, interesting little tidbits here in the layout files that I've produced for it. So, as I just mentioned, I'm working on a racetrack history video for Silverstone, and I have been uh, deep in my re research mode. Turns out that the initial layouts of Silverstone are a little bit different to what the most popular maps say. In 1950, at Copps, Beckett's and Stowe, the track cut across the apron. It didn't quite follow the outside line that it would follow from 1952 onwards. And I made an educated guess looking at uh, historic photography and said that Copps was reprofiled to run around the outside of the airfield apron in 1951. So that's the reason I have these layouts looking like they do. All of that being said, let us rank these layouts. I'm going to start with the easiest first. The 52 to 73 layout, that is an easy S tier track. Uh, excuse me, Nürburgring, put Silverstone there. I mean, Silverstone's just a monumental circuit, isn't it? And the the classic layout, this 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 flat out blast around the outside of a World War II airfield, it's a classic for a reason. And uh, for me, it it is an S tier track. This next decision might raise a few eyebrows. The 2010 to present layout of Silverstone. I know that this layout gets a lot of criticism, primarily for the arena section, the double hairpin at the start of the lap, you know, and I understand why people don't like it. it it's sort of, you know, out of place, breaks the flow of the circuit, but uh, I really, really like the current layout of Silverstone. I think it's just a, a beautiful, uh, beautiful route and, um, Let's be honest, the hairpins do provide some great racing. I would put it probably... Hmm, I, I, I wouldn't put it over Brands Hatch, okay? That, I'll, I'll, I'll give it that. I wouldn't put it over Brands Hatch, but I still think it's an A-tier circuit. I reckon A-tier fits for the 97 to 2009 layout as well. Um, I would put it just above the 2010 to present layout. I think the 1991 to 1993 layout is uh, oh, A-tier edging on S, personally. Um, when, when the track was changed in 1991, yes, it had its critics, but I think for the time, for the cars of the time, just this layout was, oh. Just, just watch archival footage of the 1993 British Grand Prix and the battles between Senna and Prost around there and you will understand why this layout of Silverstone is so highly regarded. The 1987 to 1990 layout with the more simplified Luffield chicane, I'd probably put um, maybe just below, hmm. I reckon I put it just below Adelaide in A tier. 75 to 85, I'm not really a fan of the woodcut chicane in this layout of Silverstone. So this one still A tier for the rest of the circuit, but a bit lower uh, for the woodcut chicane. I think I would put it probably below Monza, towards the bottom of A tier, but still very good. 
1950 and 1951, I'll just uh, place them at the bottom of A tier because, I mean, it's Silverstone, I love Silverstone, and, uh, you know, that that's where they belong, really, and uh, I think I would be doing the track a disservice if I put it in B tier with these layouts. Having said that, we still have the 1994 and 1996 layouts of Silverstone to contend with. Now, these layouts had some modifications done to them, of course, in the wake of Senna and Ratzenberger, and uh, I feel like it kind of broke up the flow of the track quite a bit. The 94 to 95 layout, I think I would put sort of low B tier, just above Long Beach. 1996, it had the new Stow, which was uh, which was much faster. It's the current form that the corner takes today. I think I'd still put it in B tier for uh, the the tighter cops and the final sector, um, but uh, probably not much higher than that. And now it'd be time for Singapore. I quite like Singapore. Um, I think it was another one of the tracks that got kind of a frosty reception initially, uh, especially because of the original layout having that Singapore sling <laughs> chicane at the far end of the lap. That was just an awful corner. Probably a contender for the worst chicane of all time. I reckon that goes in C tier. Um, I think I think above Las Vegas just because I like the rest. I like the rest of the layout compared to the, you know, the the sort of simplicity of of Las Vegas. But yeah, Singapore solid, okay, apart from the chicane. If I was just judging it on the Singapore sling chicane, it'd probably be like low D tier to high F. 2009 to 2012, they uh, they reprofiled the first corner. I think I would still put it in C tier for the Singapore Sling. I'll put it uh, you know right next to, slightly above the 2008 layout. Then in 2013, they fixed the Singapore Sling. They actually made it a corner instead of a chicane, and I'm glad that they managed to find a solution for that corner that worked. I think that uh, Singapore is still um, C tier, but probably above above Buenos Aires. And I'd say the same for 2015 to 2022 as well, um, when they. Uh, changed the run across the uh, across the bridge and the and the chicane before it. I do like that section uh, in this form a little bit more than I do as it originally was. And the land of the track that was run this year, I actually really like that they cut out that double chicane going in front of the grandstand. I feel like that section of the circuit was I mean, you know, it's very stop-start and, um, I don't know, kind of frustrating to watch cars go through. I know that they're probably going to be bringing it back once they finish the construction works in that area, but I find myself hoping that the 2023 layout of the circuit stays, because uh, I like that nice straight run to the final chicane. Gives another overtaking opportunity and uh, I think improves the flow of the circuit. I would put it in B tier, probably in between Reims 1950 to 1951 and the original Hockenheim. Oh god, Sochi, Jesus Christ. Can I just rant for a moment? This is one of my pet peeves, is when uh, a, a temporary circuit is announced and they call it a street circuit. And really it isn't. It's more of a racetrack and a car park. Like, it does use some public roads, I guess, but it's still largely a purpose-built venue that was initially masquerading as a street circuit. It was originally called the Sochi International Street Circuit, but now it's Sochi Autodrome. We saw the last of it in 2021, and I do not want to see it again. I think it's going at the bottom of D tier, probably, yeah, probably above Monaco but still below Harama. I would take Harama over Sochi because at least Harama's interesting. And here comes a guaranteed S tier track. Spa Francochamp. Do I really even need to say anything? It's Spa. It's just an incredible circuit in every single way. No matter what layout, we'll say for 1994, but we'll get to that. It's just, it's just incredible. I, I love it. I love it so much. 
I think if I were to choose between most sport and spa, mm, no, I'm, 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 I'm putting this, I'm putting this above into Lagos. Spa is the current leader. The 0-2 to 0-3 and 0-4 to 0-5 layout. Um, where uh, in 2004 the bus stop chicane was reprofiled and made uh, a little bit more of a sort of longer experience. I'd put the 0-2 to 0-3 layout uh, above that. 95 to 2001, where should we put you? Um, I mean, it's effectively the same layout as, as 02 to 03, except Rouge and Radion were reprofiled slightly. And I don't know which version of the corner I would, um, I would rank over the other. Hmm, this is tough. I'd probably put it above the 07 to present layout because like, I mean, the, the, the current form of the final chicane, I don't think many people are uh, really fans of that. 1994, the Chicane at Eau Rouge, um, that uh, destroyed the, the track in quite a few ways. I would probably put it okay, I guess. Um, it's in some interesting company here. I would put it, yeah, probably, probably at the top of C tier still. Not quite a D or F tier because the rest of the track was still amazing. It's just that chicane just bleh. And 83 to 93 with uh, a sort of wider run through Radiom. Not sure where to put this either. I know it's, it's an S tier track, um, but do I put it here? Oh, you know what? I think I might put it here, right at the top. And then there's the question of the original layout of Spa. I mean, it's a classic for a reason, isn't it? But then, would I rate it higher than the current circuit? I feel like they they should both be judged as their own separate thing, but at the same time, I like both of them equally for different reasons. I suppose a big minus point for the original layout is the lack of safety. You know, if you, if you made one mistake or you had a suspension failure or a tire blowout, you were going into someone's house and you were probably going to see Jesus early. I reckon, to be fair to it, I would still put it in A tier. Um, I would put it, I'd put it, yeah, right at the top of A tier, above um, Silverstone 91 to 93. And the 1950 to 1969 layout goes above 1970 because um, at, uh, at Malmedy in 1970, they slowed it down a little bit. I like the high speeds, I like the flat out blasts. Spielberg. This track has gone by many names. It started as the Österreich Ring, and uh, then when uh, Hermann Tilke redesigned it and it came back in 1997, it was called the A1 Ring, and then uh, when it came back again in 2014, it was called the Red Bull Ring. Again, when the redesigned track was revealed, I think there were a lot of people who mourned the loss of the old circuit, and it's easy to see why. It's a super fast, flowing circuit, plenty of elevation change. It's it was it was a real driver's track that one, even with the chicane at the uh, at the start of the lap. But I'll go for personal opinion here. I personally rank the current layout of Spielberg equal with its original layout. Uh, different eras, obviously, different uh, different Formula One cars. I mean, man, they, 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 they couldn't be more different from the 70s to the 80s and then from 97 and then in the turbo hybrid era as well. But for my money, I, I, put, uh, I put Spielberg above these layouts of Silverstone, but still not quite a patch on Brands Hatch. I really love Brands Hatch. The two historic layouts, meanwhile, I think I put the 77 to 87 layout uh, below the current one, and the original 1970 to 1976 layout I'll put just above 97 to present. But I think for all intents and purposes, these two layouts are equal in my eyes. I always found it funny, actually, um, you know, uh, reading about how unpopular um, the, the Red Bull ring or A1 ring as it was then uh, was when it was first revealed. People were saying, oh, you know, Hermann Tilke's destroyed a classic venue. And then 
The track went away for a while, and then when it came back in 2014, people were hailing it as the return of a classic. People have short memories. Oh, I think you know what this one's gonna be rated. Suzuka is just a phenomenon, all of its own. It has had some changes over the years that Formula One's been racing there, but they have been relatively minor. They've mostly been limited to uh, changes and repositioning of the final chicane, the Casio Triangle, and in 2001, the uh, a couple of turns in the S's were slightly reprofiled. They were moved back a little bit and, uh, and tightened as well to create a bit more runoff area at the end of the section. But I don't think that changes anything. Suzuka, in every form it has taken, is very easily S tier. Thank you very much. S for Suzuka. Now the question is, how does Suzuka stack up against Spa? I think that's the real big debate here, because like when 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 you ask people what are the best F1 tracks of all time, Spa and Suzuka are always part of the conversation, but. I feel like nobody really wants to rank one over the other, you know what I mean? They're both just as equally incredible in their own special ways. So I'm going to do something a little bit alternative here. There we go. Just alternating. Spa and Suzuka, they, 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 they share the top step. Actually, let me uh, flick this around just slightly. Um, yeah, there we go. I think I think that works out better because um, 2003 to present Suzuka, I I prefer the faster, more open Casio triangle at the end of the lap. 1987 to 1990, I like for the original profile of the S's and the original version of the Casio triangle. Um, 91 to 2000 and 2001 to 02, I think uh, they're stopped from being true top of the step because I feel like the final chicane was just a little too tight on those layouts. TI Circuit Ida, now known as Okayama International Circuit. If, uh, if you're on iRacing, I'm sure you know this track like the back of your hand. It's part of the base content and just about every series races there. Was it a good Formula One circuit though? We only have two opportunities to really assess it, 94 and 95. Um, and I think, you know, it obviously wasn't the greatest F1 track of all time, um, but it certainly wasn't bad. So I reckon it slots around about the middle top of C tier. I would choose it over Catalonia, I think. The Valencia Street Circuit. Oh dear. Another mixed feelings track, this one, because obviously when when it was it's 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 yet another track that when it was first announced, people were like, oh god, here we go, not another one and blah blah blah. But you can't say it didn't produce some exciting and and uh, very memorable moments. Mark Webber doing a backflip for one. And the 2012 European Grand Prix, Fernando Alonso driving to probably one of his greatest victories and sharing the podium with Kimi Raikkonen and Michael Schumacher for the last time. That 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 was that that was an S tier race, I think. Um, but is this an S tier track? I think decidedly not. I'd probably put it. Um, is it fair to put it below Monaco? I kind of like Singapore a little more than Valencia, so I'm going to slot it in between Singapore and Las Vegas. No, actually, hang on, no. Singapore Sling. This one goes... Uh, here. In between Hungara Ring 2 and East London. Watkins Glen, another one for the iRacers. This this track is a classic. I absolutely adore it. It's, it's awesome. The 61 to 70 layout, I would rate as pretty good, pretty, pretty damn good. Um, probably put it at the top of B tier above Monsanto. 71 to 74, when the boot was introduced and the track was widened as well. This one, I think, belongs in A tier. I would personally put it, put it above original into Lagos, actually. Um, it's, it's a beautiful high speed track. Uh, certainly got some fantastic elevation change and uh, yeah, I mean, it's Watkins Glen, what more can you say? In fact, 
might I even put it above Silverstone? I think so. And in 1975, uh, Watkins Glen was modified with a chicane put in the middle of the S's at the start of the lap. Kind of broke the flow of the circuit, but I understand why they put it in. Regardless, if I'm just judging on how much I liked it, um, I would put it in C tier, probably uh, at the top of C tier. Good showing for Watkins Glen. Uh, yes, Marina, a tale of two layouts, this one. One of the first super serious track guides I did to really get popular was Yas Marina. And uh, it was the layout that it had up until 2020. And uh, I, I still think that layout was one of the most blur Formula One tracks of all time. The final sector has zero flow. Uh, it, was a, it was a monument to, uh, to Middle Eastern excess and um, I reckon it's probably a D tier track. I'd put it I put it above Catalonia 1994 and uh, probably above yeah all of these other ones too, but uh, still you know not 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 a track I particularly love. The current layout on the other hand, this this I think was a very well informed redesign of uh, a a much maligned circuit. I I love how they um, they simplified the layout, made a couple of the turns, uh, you know, a bit more, a bit bit less work for the driver to do in terms of soaring the wheel side to side, but uh, definitely making it more of a challenge to really nail the line through. I think I'm talking in that sense about the turn five hairpin and uh, the uh, the new turn nine, the sort of semi-banked fast left-hander that takes you through to the final sector that has had pretty much all of its corners uh, sped up a little bit. Really, really good redesign. So good in my opinion that I would put it in B tier. I think uh, still towards the middle or bottom of B tier, probably around this area between Pedralbes and Estoril. Yongham, Korea International Circuit. This one's one of the most curious tracks of recent times. It was supposed to be uh, the centerpiece of a city. Really, it was meant to be like a hybrid street and uh, permanent racetrack. And it definitely had some good elements. Um, the, the final sector is really good. Um, the rest of the track is kind of like, eh, it's, it's, it's simple, but yeah, not spectacular. And as an Australian Formula One fan, uh, it will stick in my mind as the place where Mark Webber effectively lost the 2010 title. I hope we can give you another chance at some point, Korea. Um, but for now, I think I will put you in C tier, probably uh, right behind the second layout of Kyle Army. Then we get to Zandvoort. If you haven't watched my video about the history and the layouts of Circuit Zandvoort, please check it out. Uh, will there be a card up here? I don't know. If not, check the description. I reckon three out of the four layouts of classic Zandvoort are high A tier material. So 1952 to 1971, 1973 to 1978, and then 1980 to 1985. 1979 is the layout with the absolutely awfully designed chicane. That's another contender for worst chicane of all time. But the rest of the track was still pretty cool, so I think I'd put it maybe uh, near the bottom of B tier. And the current layout of Zandvoort, 2021 to the present, man. Um, I, I enjoy uh, seeing the atmosphere of the Dutch Grand Prix now, um, you know, especially with, with, you know, with Max Verstappen's success. It's really awesome to see all the Dutch fans getting together and, and supporting their guy. But considering I put the classic layouts in A tier, probably wouldn't want to put this one in A tier either. I reckon, yeah, upper middle B tier, right there. Um, I, I, I like Mont Tremblant a little bit more than current Zandvoort, but I'd probably take it over Pescara simply because it's shorter and uh, I, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I'd ever be able to learn Pescara in a sim if I even tried. Three tracks to go. We are at the tracks starting with Zed 
And um, Zeldweg is a Z grade track, but the lowest I can go is F. It's not quite as terrible as Bahrain, Detroit, and Catalonia, but uh, it, I mean, it was it, it was a super simple jaunt around an airfield, and not even an exciting one like Silverstone or Sebring. I think we can all thank our lucky stars, it only lasted one year. Final track, Zolda. Again, for tracks that host the Belgian Grand Prix, you're up against Spa. You cannot win against Spa. That said, I don't think Zolda is a D-grade track. I, I would put it maybe uh, smack dab in the middle of C. Um, Probably, I'd probably take it over Jacques Rapagua, Kyle Army. I love how the Indianapolis Oval is still sitting there like, Hello, I exist. And then 75 to 84, I would probably put around the same area too. And that is the tier list for every F1 track ever finally complete. I have been recording for two and a half hours. Thank you all so much for watching if you've lasted this far into the video and uh, make sure to get on down into the description and access the template. Make your own tier list of every F1 track ever. I'd really love to see your opinions on, uh, on what are the best and worst F1 tracks of all time. The off season is a lot shorter than it used to be, but I think we've still got plenty of time for some uh, really good uh, assessments and uh, quite a few talking points to come out of this. I want to give a huge thanks to everyone who supports me on my Patreon. If you're interested in supporting me for as little as one US dollar a month, used to be Australian dollars, but Patreon changed a couple of things in the background and now I can't charge one Australian dollar for the lowest tier. Apologies for that. But if you are interested in supporting me, you can become a patron today at patreon.com forward slash southpawracer. A big thanks to my super serious supporters, which include Adam Miller, Addison Gonzalez, Callum Crayston, Charlie Lord, Jay Kennedy, Jess Moore, Katrina Marie Payton, Malinama, The Original Sticks, Tom Hins, and Cisco Scaramuzza. Thank you all very much for watching, and I'll see you at the first corner.